In this example, we're going to take a vector file previously created in the software and using the vectors in the file, we'll look at modeling the sign using the modeling tools. We'll also look at how we can incorporate free clip art that comes with the software to complete the design. To finish, we will walk you through the toolpath setup to cut the sign that you can see here. So let's go to File, Close, and then we're going to come over to open an existing file. From the shell sign project folder, we're going to open the shell sign vector drawing file. So here I have a set of simple vectors that were drew in the software, and we're going to use these vectors to create our shell sign model. So let's come over to the view toolbar where we're going to tile our windows vertically. That way I can see the 2D view on the left hand side, and I can see the 3D view on the right hand side. In order for us to create models, we need to come over to the Modeling tab. And the Modeling tab is organised into two separate areas. So the top half of the Modeling tab that we can see here has all of the icons that will enable me to create and edit 3D shapes. The lower half of the Modeling tab, which is this area here, is what we call the Component Tree. And here is where I can view and organize our components into levels and see the result of the components and the levels, their order in the list and their combined modes over here in the 3D view and we call this the composite model. Now as we have no components in our component tree, we have no composite model visible here in the 3D view. All we can see here is the modeling plane. So let's just put that in Z. By default, in our component tree, we have level 1 here. And if we create components now, they'll be added to this level. Now the level concept is a smart way for me to organize my components. I can add multiple levels, change the combined modes of those levels and the components within those levels to create the desired composite model. Now the first shape that I'd like to look at creating will form the base shape for my sign. So we're going to look at using these two vectors. We're going to look at using this vector whereby we're going to assign a profile and give it an angle to fill the shape with a dome. And then the second shape we're going to look at creating a border using these two vectors where we're going to sweep this cross section between those two vectors using the two rail sweep. So to help me organize my component tree well in advance, I'm just going to look at renaming this level to something more appropriate to my design. So let's select the level and then I'm going to right click on that level and you'll see we're presented with a list here. Here we're just going to use this option to rename the level. You can see the text is highlighted there and so I can simply type in a new name and we're going to call this level the base level. And so anything that I create now will be added to this base level. So let's begin by creating the dome shape. So we're going to take this vector here and we're going to come over to the modeling tools first icon in the list to create shape from vector outlines so the way this tool works is we select a vector a closed vector like we have here and then we just simply assign a profile along with an angle and then we have various options here to control the height of the part to create the shape that we desire so with that vector selected, what I would like to do is create a dome shape. So we're going to look at using a curved profile. So I can just simply click on these radio buttons here and that will change the profile. In this case, we want the curved profile, so we're going to select that option. Then we need to specify an angle. I could type in a precise angle by highlighting the text there and entering a new number or I could simply use the slider here and you'll see that the software automatically updates the shape according to the angle we selected on the slider there and so we can see that here in the 3D view. 
If I wanted to put in a precise angle, I can do by just simply going into that box, highlighting the text there, and then we're just going to type in a new value. We'll put 30 in there, and I'll press spacebar to accept that, and we can see the updated shape here in the 3D view. So a very subtle dome there. Let's just put that back in the Z view. Then we have options to control the height. For the final height, we're going to set that to no limit so that the profile along with the angle just scales out in proportion against the width of the vector that we're using here. Set the combine mode of this. We'll leave this set to add, and then we could go ahead and give that a name. We're just going to call this one Dome, and I'll just type that in, and then I could go ahead and apply that and it will just update that change and then we could close out of the form and here I can see my component in the component tree added to my base level we can see the name that we gave that component when we use the create shape tool and I can see a grayscale representation of that in the 2D view and I can see the actual result there in the 3D view I can select it and you'll see that when I select the component, the grayscale and the 3D model is also highlighted. So now let's have a look at creating the border for our sign. We're going to look at using a tool called the two rail sweep, which enables us to create a shape that's defined by its rails and the cross section that we sweep between those rails. So let's come over to the modeling tools. We're going to look at the second icon, which is the two rail sweep option. And you'll see there we've now opened up the two rail sweep form. So the first thing we need to do is select our vector rails. So we're going to select this outer vector here, hold down shift, and we're going to select this inner vector. So these vectors represent the actual border itself. Then we're going to come over and we're going to use this option here to use selection. And this has now transformed those vectors into drive rails. We can see the outer vector is red, the inner vector is green, and this is all down to the order of selection. I selected the red rail first, and then I selected the inner rail second, and that's why that's green. I can see my start points here, and I can see on both of those rails we have arrows that are pointing in the same anti-clockwise direction. And so what happens now is I need to apply a cross section, which is this shape here, and with that selected, we're going to apply that to the rails, and that shape is going to be swept anti-clockwise around the two rails until it meets back up to the start point. So if that cross section selected here, we're just going to come over here, uncheck the option to sweep between spans, we're going to set the combine mode of this to add so that it adds on top of the dome that we already have visible here, and then we could go ahead and give that a name. We're going to call this border, so I'll just type that in like so, and then we could go ahead and simply press apply, and we can see the result of that there in the 3D view. Let's just close out of the two rail sweep form. I'm just going to zoom in on our border there and just to help see this a little better we're just going to undraw the visibility of the dome shape so we can take a look at that border. So this is the border we've just created and if we zoom in on this vector we can see the actual cross section transmitting round our part there. So let's put that in Z and then we're just going to zoom to fit in the 2D view. And we'll switch the dome component back on and we can just take a look at that as a whole. So I like what we've got there. So far, we've created shapes using vectors and the modeling tools. Now the next set of shapes that we're going to look at are going to be imported into our session, but we'll look at using some of the free clip art that comes with the software to complete our design. Now I want to look at bringing in a banner that would ultimately blend in with the base shapes that we've already created here. 
So what we're going to do is we're going to look at creating a brand new level, so working with a new element of my design. And so to create a new level, we simply right click on the existing level and we use this option here to insert a new level. We can see a new level has been created with the default name of level one. Again, let's just rename this to something more appropriate to what I'm doing. So we're going to right click, we're going to rename that level and we're going to call this level Banner as that's going to house the Banner component that we're going to bring in shortly. Now currently the combine mode of this level is currently set to add so any components that I bring into this level will ultimately add on top of our composite model there. In this case, as I mentioned earlier, I want this banner to blend in to our base shapes. So in order to do that, what I need to do is change the combine mode of the banner level so that it's merging in with the level below it. So to do that, let's right click on the banner. You'll see we've got the option here to alter the combine mode. And we just go down to the merge option and I click on that and that will change that so it's now merging. And I can tell because my icon has changed to the merge option. So now what we can do is we can look at importing our piece of clip art. So to do that we come over to this icon here to import a component or a 3D model and from the project folder we're going to bring in the banner piece of clip art here and we could go ahead and press open. And I can see that that banner component has been added to our banner level. Let's just look at simplifying the name of this component. To do that, I simply right click on the component, use the option to rename that component, in which case I'm just going to take everything after the word banner and then use the delete key on the keyboard to delete it. Now, if we take a look at our part, we can only see the model in our work area. So only the area of the model that overlaps the white space here will be visible in the 3D view. Now the size and position of the model will always be dictated by wherever it was saved from in the original file that it was saved in, where this was centered around 00. zero. So let's have a look at bringing our banner into the center of our job. To do that we select it, come over to transform objects and we're going to look at aligning that. So we'll use the align selected objects tool. And so we're going to align that centrally to our material. So if I click on that option there you'll see it's been moved into the center there. So let's just close that down. Now we're going to look at increasing the size of that. So with that selected let's come over and use the set selected object size. Here we're just going to alter the width, so we're going to make this a little bit larger, we're going to make that 13 inches, we're going to use this option here to link XY and that will just automatically scale the height in proportion to the value that I'm changing here. Also check auto scale Z so that the actual Z height of the component scales in proportion to the part that we're actually changing and then we could go ahead and apply that. So let's close out of the set size form. Now what I'd like to do is look at positioning the ribbon so it's in line with the Ocean Drive text. There's an easy way for me to do this. With that selected, let's come over to Transform Objects. We're going to use this icon here to move selected objects. Now we're going to move this relative to where it currently is and we're going to move that down the Y axis so it's in line with the text that we have here. So we're going to move that relative and in Y we're going to put in a negative value as we're going down here and we're going to put in a value of negative 1.6 and then we could go ahead, press apply and you'll see it's moved down and is now in line with the text there. So let's just close that down. We're just going to maximize the 3D views to take a look at what we've got so far. So you'll notice that there's areas of the banner that are actually shaded in a green colour. 
And that's the software's way of telling us that there's areas of the selected component currently being obscured by other components that we have in our job. And we can clearly see that here by looking at the border and it's that border that is actually coming in higher than some areas of the banner. Now ideally I'd like the banner to look as though it's sat in front of the base dome shape that we've got here. So we need to look at maybe increasing the height of the banner. So with that selected, let's come over to this wrench icon here where we can access the properties for the banner component. So if we click on that, we can see here it's displayed the name and it's shown us its current shape height. So here, what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to actually decrease the shape height here. So I'm going to make that 0.4, press spacebar, and that's going to update that. So you can see even more of the banner is now being obscured by the dome and more areas of the border here. But what I'm going to do is look at applying a base height, which is a vertical height that will apply underneath the actual banner shape itself. So here we're going to look at increasing that from 0 to 0.15, press space to enter that in. We can see it's added that vertical height and we can see now that it's clearly in front of the base shapes there and it's now the prominent component in the front there. So let's just put that in Z and we're just going to close out of the properties form. So now I'd like to add some decoration on top of the actual base shape here. So let's just tile our windows and as I'm working with a new element of my design I'm going to look at inserting a new level. So we'll right click on the banner level and we're going to insert a new level. See the level 1 has been added there. Again let's rename this to something appropriate to what I'm doing here so right click rename that level, we're going to call this one details. I'm going to leave the combine mode of this set to add as whatever piece of clip art I bring in I want it to ultimately add on top of our composite model here. So we've looked at how we can import clip art using this folder option here but now we're going to look at how we can access the clip art using the clip art tab. So I'm going to come over to the clip art tab now I've already installed all of the free clip art that comes with the software and so here you'll see I have a variety of folders which all house new pieces of clip art that I can access and bring into my job. So here I'm actually going to look in the decorative folder and you'll see at the bottom here we're actually displayed the pieces of clip art that we've got within that folder. So I'm just going to scroll down and I'm just going to take a look at the clip art that we've got until I find something I like the look of. Okay, so here I like this scallop shell, so I'm just going to double click that. And so when you double click on a piece of clip art, it will automatically bring that into the center of your job. So let's alter the size of that. We'll go back into the modeling tab, use the set selected object size tool. I'm going to alter the width of that to 4.8, link XY so it scales in proportion and we'll go ahead and press apply there and we can close that down. I'd like to move that up the job just a little bit. So with that selected, let's come over to move selected objects. I'm going to move that relative to its current position in the Y axis. This time we're going up so we're going to have a positive number which is going to be 0.9 press apply and you can see it's moved that there. Then we can close that down and again let's just rename this just to simplify it so we'll right click rename that and we're just going to call this one shell. And so I like the result that we've got here. So now we're almost ready to create our toolpaths. Now before we go and create our toolpaths I need to create a vector that represents the boundary of my composite model. So to do that, we're just going to start by taking the vectors that we have here. So we'll take that cross section, shift and select the outer border, shift and select the inner border vector. We're going to right mouse click. I'm just going to temporarily move them to a new layer. So we're going to move them to a new layer. We'll just call that one layer 2. Make that invisible, inactive. I don't need these vectors anymore, but I'd still like to have access to them in my file. So I'm moving them to a new layer that is invisible and inactive. 
So let's go ahead and press OK. If I go to my Layers tab, we can see the new layer here has been added, Layer 2, and if I click on that, that's where the vectors are. So let's just hide the visibility of Layer 2 there. I'm going to go into the Modeling tab, and to create my vector boundary, I'm going to select all my components in my component tree. So start with the Shell component, I'm going to hold down Shift and select the Dome component so that everything is now selected there. And then we can come over and use this option here to create a vector boundary around the selected components. And so if we just click into the white space to deselect those components, we can see the vector has been created around our part. So now we're ready to go and switch over to the Toolpaths tab to begin creating the toolpaths to cut the part out. So to do that, let's come up to the top of the Modeling tab. We're going to use this icon here to switch over to the Toolpath commands. That will temporarily hide the Design tabs on the left and it will open up the Toolpaths on the right-hand side. And so the first thing we need to do is set up our material. So we'll use this Set button here to access the Material Setup form. The material thickness we're working with is 3 quarters of an inch. XY position, so this is where we tell the software where on the machine we want to set the X0, Y0. So we're going to choose the lower left because that's typically the way most CNC machines are referenced from in the lower left. And that way the X and the Y values will always be positive. But you should always pick one that is suitable for your machine. We're going to set the Z0 off the material surface here. And then we move on to the model position in the material. You can see straight away we have an error message telling us that the model thickness exceeds the material thickness. And we currently have a model thickness of 0.8362. So we'll need to look at either decreasing the model thickness or increasing the actual material that we use. In this case, we can look at decreasing the model thickness. To do that, we use the set option here and I'm going to give this a new height of 0.55 and then we're going to go ahead and press apply and then we can close that down and so we can see there that error message has now disappeared. Now because we have a 3D object we need to relate where the model is going to be positioned within our material block. So this lighter colour that you can see here within our block of material represents the actual model that we plan to cut. And I can use this slider here to position that within our material block. Now it's a good idea to apply a small gap above our model, so if there is any discrepancies in your material flatness or how you set the Z0, this gap above will ensure you avoid any flat spots. So we're going to put in a small value here of 0 0.05. Moving down the material setup form, you want to make sure that your rapid seed gaps above your material, home and start position are all safe and appropriate for your particular machine. And then we'll just go ahead and press OK. And now we can start by looking at our first toolpath. The first toolpath we're going to look at is the 3D roughing toolpath and this will enable us to use a large tool to hog out the majority of the material. So we need to select this vector here, so this is our vector boundary, and this will govern the area that we want to create our toolpaths. So with that selected, let's come over to the 3D roughen toolpath there. So the first thing we need to do is specify a tool that we want to use. So if we use the select option here, that's going to open up the tool database, and you'll see here I have a variety of tools in here. In this case, I'd like to use the quarter inch end mill to cut this part out. I could check over the settings, ensuring they're safe and appropriate for my setup. I'm OK with that, so I'm going to go ahead and press OK there. Then, now that we've got our tool, we need to choose the actual machine and limit boundary. Now, we've already created a vector boundary that represents the outline of our composite model, so we're going to use the selected vector option here. 
Then we move on to the boundary offset. Now as we're working with a positive shape, it's a good idea for me to input a boundary offset. So that the center of the tool doesn't just come up to the vector, it's going to come past it by the amount that we offset it by, so it can cut down the size of our model. Now a good offset to use is the radius of the tool plus the machining allowance. So we're going to leave that at 0.18 there. Let me move on to the machining allowance. And this is a skin of material the software will leave on the model to protect the finish so that the larger tool doesn't chip at the surface of the finished part. Again, this is a good allowance to leave there, so I'll leave that at 0.03. And then we move on and we specify the roughing strategy. So there's two kinds here. We have Z-level and we have 3D raster. So Z-level means that we cut in 2D slices of the part and leave a stepped finish. And 3D raster, which is more like a semi-finish, will go back and forth over the part with the roughing tool. So we're going to use the Z-level option where we're going to raster in X. We're going to choose to profile this last, so after it cuts a level, it will run a profile pass to clean up the edge of the level where there is a 3D object before it goes down into the next level. Moving down to the bottom, we can give that a name. So we're just going to call this one 3D Roughing Sign, and then we could go ahead and press Calculate. And so this will automatically open up the preview toolpaths form. We can see the toolpath represented by these blue lines here in the 3D view. And to get a more accurate representation of what we're going to expect when we cut that out on our machine, we can come over here and preview that toolpath. And you can see it's simulating how we'd actually see that on our machine. If we maximize the 3D view, we can just take a look at that. We can see those steps in there. And this pretty much is an exact idea of what we're going to see when we cut this out on the CNC. So let's just put this in Z, and then we'll just close that down. We'll just tile our windows, and now we're going to look at creating our finishing pass. So with that vector still selected, we're going to come over and open up the 3D finishing toolpath. And so this is where we use a much finer tool to get in to get all of the detail that we can see in our model when we come to cut the part. So the first thing we need to do is specify a tool. Okay, So the tool that I actually want to use is currently selected here, which is the 8th inch ball nose. So I could use the edit option here just to glance over the settings here. You can see we've got a step over of 10%, which will give me a nice smooth finish there. I could go ahead and press OK. We need to define the machine limit boundary again. We're going to use that vector to govern this toolpath. Again, we'll apply a small offset here so that the tool rolls past the part so it can cut down the side of our model. So we'll leave that offset of 0.8 in there. Area machine strategy, again, we're going to do this in a raster strategy with an angle of zero degrees so it's parallel to the x axis. And then we could go ahead and give that a name, we'll call that 3D finish sign, and simply press calculate, and that will just calculate that toolpath for us. And so if I zoom in into the 3D view, you can see those steps are much closer together there. Just put that in C and we could go ahead and preview that toolpath. We could take a look at how the part will look when we cut that out on our CNC. Okay, let's maximize the 3D view. Okay, I think we've got a lot of detail in there. We've picked up all of the vital decoration in there. And we've got a nice smooth finish. So let's just put that in C. Then we're just going to tile those windows and we'll just close out of the preview toolpaths form. So now we're going to look at v-carving this ocean drive text into the banner of our sign. So to do that we select the text, with that selected come over to the v-carve engraving toolpath. The first thing we need to do is specify the cutting depth. Now in this case we're going to have the start depth set to zero. Now it's not actually going to be zero relative to the material because further down the form I'm going to use this option here to project the toolpath onto the 3D model. In terms of the model itself the start depth will be at zero and it will be on the surface of the banner here. 
So I'm going to need to specify a tool, so use the select option here to open up the tool database. Here I'm going to use a 90 degree half inch V bit. I can check over the settings that we've got for this tool, happy with those, so we can go ahead and press OK. Working our way down to the bottom of the form, as I said, we're going to check this option here to project the toolpath onto the 3D model. And so what we're doing is we're ultimately telling the software to take the toolpath and instead of cutting that from a specific depth, we're going to project it down the z-axis until it hits the 3D model and then v-carve whatever settings we have for that tool into the model itself, that being the banner here. So again, let's give that a name, we'll call that one VCarve Sign, go ahead and press Calculate. And then we could maximise the 3D view, we can see that toolpath there, we could just go ahead and preview that. Okay, so I can see we've got some nice crisp text in there, so it's nicely on top of the banner. So let's just close that down, again let's tile the windows. And the last toolpath we're going to look at is the profile toolpath and that will enable us to cut our sign out of the material block. So we need to select that boundary vector which is this one here. That's selected, let's come over to toolpath operations and we're going to use the profile toolpath. So here we need to specify our start depth. So start depth is going to be at zero on top of our material here. Cut depth, we're going to cut all the way through our material. So that's three quarters of an inch, I can see that there. Then we're going to choose a tool. You can see we've got an end mill, quarter inch end mill there. That is the tool that I'd actually like to use. You can see it's currently cutting that in six passes. If we use the edit option here, we can edit the settings for this tool for this particular toolpath alone. In which case I'm going to look at increasing the pass depth here. If I feel it's safe to do so, the material that I'm cutting, I'm going to increase that to a quarter of an inch. Go ahead, press OK, and I can see that we are now cutting that in three passes. Then we choose how we machine those vectors on the outside, the inside, or actually on the vectors here. In this case, we're going to use the outside option. Moving further down the form, if I wanted to, I could add tabs to my toolpath. In this case, I have a vacuum hold down system, so I don't need to add tabs. Then I could just go ahead and give our toolpath a name. We're just going to call this one Profile Sign. Press Calculate, maximise the 3D view here, and we can see those toolpaths there. And then we could just simply preview that, and you'll see it's cut that out. And if I wanted to, I could double click on the waste material to remove it from my view, so I get a more accurate representation of what our finished sign will look like. So let's just double click on the waste material there and then we could just take a look at our overall finished part. Now it's very important that your part looks correct at this stage as the toolpath preview shows you a very accurate representation of what we would see on our CNC machine if we was to go ahead and run these toolpaths. So if something doesn't look as you wanted it here at this stage, you can go back and make edits to the toolpaths, recalculate them until you are satisfied with the results that you see here in the toolpath preview. And that's what makes the toolpath preview such a powerful tool. Now if I wanted to, I could go ahead and save out a preview image of this to send over to my customer to proof this before I go ahead and actually run those toolpaths on my CNC machine. So let's just close this down. And so once I have the approval from my customer to go ahead and cut this out, we can go and save out those toolpaths. To do that, I simply select a toolpath, come over to Save Toolpaths, so here I can see under toolpaths to be saved, the 3D roughing sign, which is the one I currently have highlighted here, is visible in the list. What I then need to do is come over and select a post processor from the drop down list. So this post processor will format the data for that particular machine. So you need to choose one that's suitable for yours. In this case, I'm going to go with the G code and I could just simply go ahead and save that toolpath, give that a name, and we'll just save it. And we'll do the same for the other toolpaths where we select them. You can see it listed here and then we'd save that toolpath out and we'd do the same for the other toolpaths there. 
And so that completes this tutorial, so let's go ahead and save the file. So we'll go to File, Save As, and in the project folder we're going to call this one Shell Sign Getting Started, press Save, and you can access that from the project folder.